going to talk about innovating with accessibility. Uh, but first, we're going to talk about race cars. Uh, I promise this is a talk about innovation and accessibility. But uh, we're going to start here. I want to ask you all a question. I want you to look at this car. Tell me what would make you nervous about driving around an old dirt track in this car, engines screaming, other cars racing around you. Uh, you know, how, how do you feel about that? Um, how about uh, that lack of a roll cage? Does that feel, that feel good? Maybe the gas tank sitting right behind the driver, those tires really feel like they're gonna grip the road. How about that helmet, whatever she's wearing? I don't know if that's gonna really prevent a traumatic brain injury. Uh, that bomber jacket doesn't feel particularly flame retardant. You definitely get the sense that she is not safe in this car at all. Um, when we talk about racing, what we're talking about is what engineers call a extreme use case. Extreme use case. Not an edge case, extreme use case. Uh, an edge case is a thing that hardly ever happens. Racing happens all the time, and they're using things in an extreme way. Uh, so think about it this way. Um, you, the, it's an extreme use case because people want to go very fast, but they don't want to get hurt. And the innovations and things that come out of racing find their way into our everyday cars. So your car has a roll cage to protect you and keep you safe in the event of a rollover. You have anti-lock brakes and sophisticated suspension systems that keep your car gripped to the road in rough roads or wet, wet surfaces. Uh, your car has a rear view mirror. Look at this. They haven't even invented the rear view mirror yet. The rear view mirror was invented in racing because it's way easier and safer to look in the mirror than to crank your head around, not know where you're going. Uh, this is how innovation happens in the automotive industry. So you'll have something that comes from racing. Here's how I spent my misspent youth in uh, college, building and racing solar-powered race cars. We raced this car from Chicago to LA along Old Route 66. This car used about as much power as a hair dryer. Uh, it would maintain highway speeds all day, no problem, off of uh, solar and the batteries that the solar was charging. Did not have an air conditioner. But it did have a video rear view system. It had a roll cage. Our, our drivers were very comfortable and reasonably safe inside. The funny thing is, the original engineers at Tesla were doing this around the same time I was. Uh, they were at the Stanford solar car team and uh, they invented uh, many, many processes to build the Tesla. Now, regardless of what you think of Tesla's management, they, they made one of the safest, most robust, most powerful cars on the road. Uh, that's how innovation goes from racing. It goes from racing to luxury cars for people who can afford those expensive features. And eventually, those features make their way down to something like the Nissan Leaf something that is a more mass consumer sort of product of a car. You would feel way less vulnerable in this car. You'd feel way safer because it was made with all of those safety features in from the beginning. So let's look at a different type of minimalistic high-tech vehicle. Uh, this person is using a vehicle that is customized to them. It's exceedingly lightweight. It's made of space age materials but they're using it in an environment that wasn't built for them, uh, that, 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 that just wasn't designed for someone who is not fully abled and walking. Uh, you know, we can all, I, I didn't see anybody with motor disabilities in here, but most of us can navigate this curb with no problem. Six inch curb, no problem, I will step over it. But it's still an obstacle that we have to navigate, right? You still have to do it. So what's the solution here for someone using a wheelchair? Well, you've seen this, it's called a curb cut. So you see these ramps that are cut into the sidewalk, that's called a curb cut. It's a simple, safe, cheap feature that helps people who are using a wheelchair of some sort uh, move from point A to point B and cross the street safely. It allows them to do it with dignity. They don't need help. They're not in any danger. Uh, and they are safer doing it that way. And if I pointed at one of these and asked you what's that for, you'd say, oh, well, that's for someone using a wheelchair. But who else does this curb cut help? Helps someone maybe pushing a, pushing a baby down the, down the sidewalk. It helps someone with limited mobility. Maybe they're older and they use a cane to get around. 
could help someone who is, uh, just had knee surgery like I did a few years ago and was on crutches for several weeks. Could help someone who is fully abled, uh, fixated on TikTok and pushing a child. Okay, it gets all of these people to the same goal, which is to cross the street from point A to point B. Uh, this simple, safe feature that was made for people with disabilities made life better for everyone. We're gonna talk about that a lot today. Now, believe it or not, this was a controversial idea. Uh, as, especially after World War II, more and more veterans returned home from the war, surviving horrific injuries, and now having disabilities. These were men who, and, and, and some women, who wanted to live a full life, wanted to get around their hometowns, wanted to get around and engage in life, okay? But they couldn't because there weren't curb cuts, buildings weren't made for people using wheelchairs. Uh, they had a difficult time. Uh, this was just controversial. Really up until the 80s, cities would push back. Uh, bureaucrats would push back. The argument was always the same. Well, yeah, but how many people does this really affect? Uh, how, you know, we can't really afford one new regulation. This seems like a lot of extra work for just a few people. No joke, uh, in Denver, there was a point at which people who used wheelchairs were going out on the street corners with sledgehammers and busting up the curbs so the city would have to come in and install curb cuts in their neighborhood because the city wouldn't do it. So, so okay, great, Charlie, you're right, we're on board, we're gonna go do accessibility, we're gonna incorporate a bunch of accessibility features into our, into our digital products. Just be careful, you can do it wrong. Um, here's a curb cut, somebody was pretty, pretty proud of this, uh, but there's a problem with it, right? You can see it. I want to address some accessibility myths that uh, are very prevalent, especially in the UX and UI space. One of them is that accessible design is clunky or ugly or garish. Uh, it's just not true. There are precisely zero reasons why a design that is fully accessible is not also completely beautiful. Look at this store. This is the uh, Apple store, um, I believe in Palo Alto uh, at Stanford. This store was designed from the beginning to be completely accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, you can see that it's all one level. There are no stairs. There's no elevators to traverse. All of the aisles are wide enough for someone to get into. Uh, the tables are set up in such a way you can roll a wheelchair up to it and experience the products. This is not an ugly building. Uh, this is a beautiful building. Can you imagine being an architect and creating a building and saying, you know what, I don't really want to build this building for people using a wheelchair. I don't want to build this building for people who are blind. We're not going to worry about that. Like, you'd be horrified by that. But companies make that decision every day in the digital space. So some introductions are in order. I've talked to you a little bit about race cars. Uh, we looked at a, at a fancy store. Uh, my name is Charlie Triplett. Uh, I am otherwise a very normal, uh, boring white guy with uh, salt and pepper hair. I do enjoy hiking in very, very remote places. Uh, this is a Himalayan trek in Nepal. I do go chasing waterfalls. Uh, sorry, TLC. Uh, and I enjoy traveling with Truman the Tiger here. Uh, this little plushie has been with me all over the world. It's the mascot of the University of Missouri where I graduated with a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Design. I didn't learn to code until much later in my career. Uh, so I come at accessibility uh, from both sides of the house. I can talk to designers, I can talk to engineers, and I tend to go to a lot of design and development conferences rather than pigeonholing myself with accessibility. But coming out of college, we didn't learn about accessibility. Uh, around that time, everybody was talking about, well, we want to focus on the average user. We got this bell curve idea here. All of our average users are in the middle. That's who we want to focus on. Uh, around 2014, I started to focus on accessibility because of some fantastic people in my life who challenged me on the way I was designing things. And I began to see that the insights I was gaining by designing and developing for people with disabilities, these people on the so-called edges that I later learned to call extreme use case, were giving me the best insights I'd had in design in my entire career. And in fact, all of these so-called average people in the middle we're just validating my insights. And here's the other half of that. This is not about a few people. Accessibility is not 
a small portion of the population. About a quarter, over a quarter, of people in the United States have a disability of some kind. Uh, the, the numbers are very similar in the EU. I didn't have time to break this down by member state, but it's very similar. Now, this number is very, very deceiving because this doesn't take into account people who use accessibility features in their digital devices. I have recently come to the age where I had to increase the font size on my phone. <laughs> I'm upset by this. Uh, I saw, I've seen a survey that was conducted, I believe, in Denmark. They found that uh, about, I think, 60% of people were increasing the font size and using accessibility features on their phone in some way. Uh, if you look at this from a Gen X perspective, we're all at that age where we're starting to need to increase the font size on our phone. We're beginning to need those accessibility features. So we're talking about way over half of the population now. Just to level set on what we mean by uh, digital accessibility, there are different ways that people interact with their computer. So if you have a motor disability, and maybe you can't use a mouse or a trackpad, you might use your keyboard to interact with your computer. You might use uh, something that's more akin to a joystick, something uh, that is more like a set of buttons that's tailored to you. Uh, you might use voice command and talk directly to your computer. If you have vision disabilities, we're talking about everybody from just low vision, people with very, very, you know, not, they're not blind, but they just have low vision, uh, to people who are completely blind. They can't see their screen, so they will use uh, applications called a screen reader that reads what's happening on their screen to them. Uh, and people with low vision use magnification tools to uh, zoom in on their screen and interact with it that way. If you went to our workshop, you experienced that firsthand. Uh, people who are deaf or hard of hearing uh, rely on captions or transcripts or live uh, translations for live events of uh, sign language. And when we're talking about cognitive disabilities, there's a wide range of approaches we can take to make our digital products better for people who perceive the world differently. Now, believe it or not, all of you use assistive technology every day. Your mouse or your trackpad, guess what? That's assistive technology, why? because you can't plug yourself directly into your computer. You need an interface in order to interact with your machine. Okay, so when we think about disabilities though, we tend to think of them as permanent and complete. Uh, we think about someone who is permanently using a wheelchair or someone who uh, permanently has hearing loss or someone who permanently is blind. The thing is we will all experience temporary or situational disabilities, especially as we get older. Uh, I had knee surgery, I believe in 2016. I was on crutches. I had a temporary disability. I had stairs and things were very, very difficult. If you're taking cold meds that are interfering with your ability to remember things or focus, you have a temporary cognitive disability. Uh, you might be walking around the office, holding your laptop, carrying your phone. You've now given yourself a motor disability. You've essentially got, uh, you're down to like one thumb, and one eye because you're walking down the hallway and you don't want to smash into somebody with your laptop. Uh, we can talk about, uh, you know, you will be in situational disabilities where it's difficult to hear. Maybe you're in the airport and you want to consume a video, but you can't because of the noise of the intercom and the people around you. Uh, suddenly, a video with captions is still consumable by you. So that was pretty heavy. I want to take a break from that. I love Venn diagrams. Anybody else love Venn diagrams? Okay, we got some hands. This is the greatest Venn diagram ever made. I want this. I want, I want, I want like a Chuck E. Cheese style animatronic. I don't mean CGI. I mean actual like robot puppets come out of the stage. I want to see this band. This is amazing. Let's look at another Venn diagram. This one's practically a circle. Um, I think it's important to understand that accessibility is not a big scary topic. What we're talking about is that people with disabilities want basically the same things that people without disabilities want. Just a thin sliver of things that are helpful to people who are using assistive technology. This Venn diagram, again, is practically a circle. So one more myth I want to address here at the beginning. There's kind of a notion that you know, accessibility, we don't have to worry about that. We have an automated tool that's checking this. Mm. 
Okay, so let's come back to our curb cut here. The robot that's gonna test this is going to measure the width, the height of the curb cut. It's gonna measure the slope of the ramp. It's gonna make sure that it's the right depth. A robot can measure those, those kinds of things. It can take measurements of things. It can tell you if it meets the syntax or the code uh, conformance of things, but it can't use it. Okay, a robot can look at this curb cut and still not understand that this curb cut is completely inaccessible. Who here was around for the launch of the iPhone? Who had the first iPhone? Or maybe the second iPhone that was like a 3G enabled so you didn't have to be on Wi-Fi? Okay, there's a few hands. That makes me feel a little better. I appreciate that. Oh, one more. Okay, we got one more hand in there. Okay, feeling even better now. So for those of you who weren't there, this is what the web looked like on a mobile device. Uh, there was no such thing as responsive design. There was no such thing as mobile first. If you wanted to interact with a website, this is what it looked like. Uh, you had to pinch and zoom in to get to anything. Everything was very tiny. Everything was very small. It was difficult to read. Uh, it was like having a vision and a motor disability all at the same time because all the text was very small. The buttons were very tiny. Uh, it was a pain in the butt to use. It wasn't fun. We were in the uh, scary old race car version of the web at that time. Then, 2010, Ethan Marcotte comes along and writes Responsive Design, um, where we learned how to design mobile first. We had learned how to make something work on mobile and desktop and not do two different versions, because that's what we were doing in 2007. We said, aha, I will make a mobile version a separate version over here that I think suits people in mobile. And I'll keep my desktop version the same, and those versions did not learn from each other. Once we brought them both together, some interesting things started to happen. We went from the scary old race car to the luxury sports sedan of design. We went from a website that you had to pinch and zoom in to something that was responsive, to something that responded to your browser. It was a big deal. It was amazing. But by accident, we also did some really great things for accessibility at that time without knowing it. We installed some digital curb cuts. Let's look at some of those. So we made buttons really big on mobile because we realized, yeah, you need to be able to tap the button. When we put that on desktop, oh my goodness, look at that. More people click on the buttons we want them to click on because they can find it. Amazing. But this also helped people with motor disabilities people who experience tremors, or people who just have a hard time being precise with their mouse or with their tapping their screen. Digital curb cut. Uh, we simplified processes. We took processes that might have been nine or 10 steps that were very, very slow to load as well, but you know, you're on your computer, you're sitting in front of your desk, it don't matter. But suddenly, if you are walking around with your phone, you're not wanting to wait, and also, your internet connection is not uh, jacked into the ethernet, so we needed to make things faster and load faster. Okay, so by making things load faster, we help people with uh, difficulty focusing, dif difficulty paying attention. Uh, by simplifying processes, we made it better for people with cognitive disabilities. We installed digital curb cuts, we didn't even know it. Things that were better for everybody, but turns out they were also good for people with disabilities. But here's the thing, this is gonna be controversial. I don't know that we've had a big innovation since then. You know, this, this uh, tweet, or X, or whatever. 2016, which one of the possible two websites are you designing? It's still kind of true. I mean, AI gave us this, which I guess is kind of new. But um, we have not experienced a big revolution like we had in 2010 since then. We've made little improvements. You know, we, we got JavaScript frameworks. There's a new one every week. But What's changed since then? Not a lot. It's kind of where we are right now. Um, I can tell you where innovation doesn't happen. When we design for what we think of as the average user, which, okay, we work in tech, especially if you're talking about the dev environment or you're talking about tech leadership, we're talking about white, boring white guys, uh, guess what you're gonna end up with is products that are really just working for them and we're missing out on certainly 25% of the population and the innovation that could happen there. And then we're trying to apply that solution to everybody. It means we're losing some people, we're excluding more people than we really think 
It means we're losing revenue. It means we're increasing the risk of, of a complaint. In the states, we have this act called the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. Uh, it allows people to file a complaint against a company for an accessibility violation for just about anything. You will soon have the European Accessibility Act coming, into, coming online in, I think, June of 2025. Uh, we don't know what those complaints are gonna look like, but they can be quite hefty and certainly very disruptive. So where do we go from here? Like, where do we go from 2010? How, where, where do we go? Well, I think it's the same answer. Uh, it's the same answer we were talking about with race cars. We need to find extreme use cases. Here we go. Let's talk about what innovation is. Uh, I think it's easy to fall into a sense that innovation is like great big disruptive uh, things. Okay, but it's not. Really, most innovation happens up here in the sustaining innovation portion of things. But it also happens in the disruptive spaces as well. Okay, so Sam Farber invented OXO brand of kitchenware because he saw his wife, who has arthritis, trying to use one of these demons. Crappy race car, sports sedan. A company called Fingerworks invented a keyboard that barely takes any pressure to operate because they were creating it for people with carpal tunnel syndrome or chronic fatigue. Apple bought the licensing to that and it's still part of the uh, iPhone patents because they needed the technology of something that you could barely or imprecisely touch, okay? We did it again. Uh, these pill bottles, terrible to open and close, right? A company called PillPack came along and said, well, what can we do better? How can we make a better bottle? Their conclusion was, we don't want a bottle. What we want to do is individually package all of the medications people need. Uh, well, what would they do there? Well, they made it easier for people with arthritis to open the packets. They made it easier for people with poor memory or cognitive disabilities to take their pills on time because they're all labeled by day and by time. It was acquired by Amazon a couple years ago for $700 million. So one last myth before I go. Uh, you will come across this that, oh yeah, accessibility, that's a thing. We need to put some legal disclaimers and some special code in our website or something. That's not true. Um, no level of uh, terms of service agreement or disclaimer or code injection can create innovation. It doesn't work that way. Um, so, in the future, what I hope we can do as UX researchers, as UX designers, is research and find ways to remove the barriers that people with disabilities experience with our products. Design with inclusion, we had some talks about that, but inclusion includes people with disabilities. And now we'll have something that we can apply to all. So, I'll leave you with my favorite Venn diagram. Go find your own Venn diagrams. Turn them into circles. That's where the innovation is. Is finding those extreme use cases and making them something that we have solved for and created some little innovation in some little way for people who were otherwise unable to use our products. Thank you.